Hey, good morning, everyone. Let's go to our scripture reading. It's taken from Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. This is God's word. Hearing your voice played back from a recording is a bit unnerving, isn't it? I think you're probably like most people. When you hear your voice played back, you think, that's not me. That doesn't sound like me. Your, your head cocks and you think there's something distorted going on. Um, I don't believe it. That's not me. Until a friend taps you on the shoulder and says, yeah, that's you. Or even more disconcerting, a few years ago when we were live streaming the messages, um, I would catch sight of myself in the TV screen every once in a while. And when the live stream was over, I'd look at Tim who was running the camera and I'd say, who is that guy? His hairline is receding, his nose is crooked, his eyes are uneven. That's not me. Tim would just chuckle. Yeah, that's you. That's you. In this section of the letter of Romans, Paul has been telling all humanity, you're sinful. And humanity doesn't believe it. And Paul keeps tapping him on the shoulder over and over again. Yeah, yeah, you are. And in our passage today, it's no different. He's telling humanity, yes, you are under the power of sin. Yes, you are responsible for a variety of sins. And without Jesus Christ, you have absolutely no hope. And why? Because of what he says in verse 20, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But we have Christ. Christ. And so since we do, let's look at the passage from that point of view. Christ frees us from the power of sin. Christ frees us from a variety of sins. And Christ is our hope. So, first of all, Christ frees us from the power of sin. Paul, again, has been talking about that all humanity is under sin. He uses the designations of Jews and Greeks. That means everyone. And he says here in verse 10, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Notice what Paul does not say. He does not say sins. He says sin. In other words, Paul is not saying that all of us have committed individual sins, though that is absolutely true. What he means is that we are under sin, which means that we are under sin's power. We are under the power of sin. It is the reason that we commit individual sins, because we are under the power of sin. In other words, being under sin is being enslaved to it. It holds a power over over us that we cannot resist on our own. Everyone in the world is under the power of sin. Now let's be very careful here to make some distinctions, all right? Being under the power of sin does not mean certain things. Being under the power of sin, for example, does not mean that we are as bad as we could be. Thank the Lord. Because of his common and sustaining grace, we are not as bad as we could be. It doesn't mean that. 
It also doesn't mean that we are all guilty of the same sins. There are a variety of sins out there among us. Not all of us match everyone else's experience. And it also doesn't mean that we wreak havoc like everyone else. Some people wreak more havoc than others. Being under the power of sin doesn't mean those things. What it means is that on your own, you are lost. And there are no degrees of lostness. Everyone is lost. So imagine two people, and both of them have died. One of them is 102 years old and dies peacefully in their sleep. The other loses control of their car driving off the side of a cliff and dies in a fiery crash. Can we say that one person is more dead than the other? Of course not. Are there degrees of death? No. And that's Paul's point here. Those who are under sin are all under the power of sin. All are lost. And what is needed is a new power to break in and set people free from sin. A power found in and only in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you see now how Paul has arranged this argument in Romans? Going way back to chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, what does Paul say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is the power that has freed us from the power of sin. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And once that power has turned us around, life is completely different, isn't it? That means that we have been raised spiritually. We are no longer dead in our sins and our trespasses, but we are now alive to Christ. I personally think spiritual life is a difficult subject to get your mind around, and I think that the New Testament helps us with that concept because as Jesus went around and raised the dead to new life and there was shock and there was surprise and there was joy that accompanied those things, the same is true now that the power of Christ has set us free from spiritual death. There's shock, there's joy, there's surprise. There ought to be something different about us. We have been raised from the dead. We no longer wreak havoc like we used to with our sins. Our sins grow more burdensome and worrisome to us. But thankfully, we have God's grace and love so that we can reach out to him in repentance. We're no longer under its power. We're no longer enslaved to it. The way I like to think about it, if you've ever been whitewater rafting, you know, anybody who has whitewater raft on a major river realizes there is absolutely no way you can turn that boat around and go the other way. You are just carried down that river by its current. Think of sin that way. Think of being lost that way. You are carried down that current. There's no possible way for you to turn that boat around and go the other way. That's what Christ's power does. And if you were to see it on the river, somebody all of a sudden rowing the other way and making progress, you'd say, what is going, you'd be shocked, you'd be surprised, you'd be delighted. That is something that's incredible, you would say. That is the power of Christ to heal us. He sets us free from the power of sin. He really has done that for us. So the gospel conquers the power of sin. And now the gospel also helps us overcome sins because Christ has set us free from a variety of sins. Paul's point in this section of Romans is once again to point out to humanity that there's absolutely nothing you can think, nothing you can say, nothing you can do that can earn your way to salvation. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. You need to be released from that thought. And once you're released from that thought and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then he will begin to slowly release you from the sins that you battle in life. So what does Paul do here? This is what he does. He gives us a number of categories. He talks about, for instance, the person that is you and me. 
what we believe, our psyches, what we think. He talks about the person. And then he talks about relationships. And then he talks about worship. And he talks about all three of these categories in order to show how everything that's a part of our lives is filled with sin. And there's, po- there's no way possible for us to find Christ without his graceful, great, graceful help in our lives. You ever hear somebody say you should never say never? You know, don't talk in those kind of absolutes. Did you notice all of the absolute ways that Paul talks throughout this text? None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. No one does good. Not even one. Later on, he, in verse 19, he uses the word every, and then he also uses the word whole. These are absolutes that Paul is using. And what they are meant to do is to to bring together these different aspects of our humanity, our persons, our relationships, our worship, in order to show us once again that we are sinners. So Paul brings together a number of aspects in our person to show us the hopelessness of of our situation. He says none is righteous. Righteousness here is probably getting at the idea of morality. So he is saying Everyone is sinful. No one is sinless. In other words, sin corrupts our actions, he says. He then says no one understands. That's a reference to our intellect. The intellect is stained by sin. Sin corrupts our thinking. No one seeks God, he says. That's a reference to our desires and affections. They too are stained by sin. Sin corrupts our wills. And then he finally says, all have become worthless. No one does good. The commentators tell us that the word worthless was used for milk that has gone sour. Milk that has gone sour is completely useless. Paul is saying everyone is useless because no one does good. I think we need to pause again for a moment. And just kind of nuance this so we understand it. Because I really do want you to understand what Paul is saying. Some of your sensibilities may have been offended when you heard that no one does good. Some of your understanding may have been offended. We need to pause for a moment and consider what Paul really is saying. Because don't you know many Christians who do good? Everyone's afraid to express their answer. (laughs) In the church, they do good. In the families, they do good. At work, they do good. Many Christians do good to people around them. In fact, what does Paul say elsewhere in Ephesians 2? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. And and while we're on the subject, what about non-Christians? When we look out there in the world, don't we know many non-Christians who do good? Who do noble and wonderful and beautiful good, making the world a more livable place? I don't think Henry Ford was a Christian, but I kind of am delighted by Mr. Ford every time I get in the car on a frosty morning and I can hit that little button that warms my seat. It makes life a little more livable. We Christians can and we should appreciate non-Christians' contributions to this world because God has made them in his image and has blessed them with talents and with wisdom. But our good deeds, any good that we could come up with, has all been touched by sin. And so they are not a way to salvation. Not at all. In fact, Charles Spurgeon tells a delightful story in one of his messages. It goes like this. Once in a kingdom long ago, a gardener grew a huge carrot and decided to give it to his prince because he loved his sovereign. When he gave it, 
The prince discerned his love and devotion and that he expected nothing in return. So as the gardener turned to leave, the prince said, Here, my son, I want to give you some of my land so you can produce an even greater crop. It's yours. And the gardener went home rejoicing. But a nobleman heard of this incident and thought, If that is what the prince gives in response to the gift of a carrot, what would he give to me if I gave him a fine horse? So the nobleman came and presented the prince with a fine steed as a gift. But the prince discerned his heart and said, You expect me to give you as I did to the gardener, don't you? I will not. You are very different. The gardener gave me the carrot, but you were giving yourself the horse. All of our good deeds are tainted by sin. They do not give us access to God's majesty. But we do good things. People do relative good. But no one does anything savingly good that would merit salvation with God. That's Paul's point. Sin so pervades the whole person that no one can come to God in their own goodness. We need the goodness of another to come get us. And what does Christ do? He gives far more than a carrot or a steed to his Father in heaven. He gives his life so that we can be saved. So that's sin as part of our person. Then there is sin as part of our relationships. Again, another variety of the way we sin. In verses 13 through 17, Paul writes, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongue to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace, they have not known. So, again, Paul brings together a number of elements which are involved in relationships, right? Because we use our words to speak to others in relationships. We use our feet to walk with others through life. Words and feet are a part of our relationships. And Paul is now saying our relationships show us the hopelessness of our situation. How does Paul do that? He says that we sin by our words. I've always been fascinated with this progression that you see here from throat to tongue to lips to mouth. What is Paul doing? I think he's doing a couple of things. On the one hand, I think Paul is just showing the natural progression of how word develops out of your mouth, right? It starts with the air in your lungs. It's pushed up through your throat. That goes to the tongue, then to the lips, out of the mouth. But Paul is doing far more than just simply showing us a progression. He mentions all of these parts of the development of a word, throat, tongue, lips, mouth, in order to say nothing about our words is good. Their throat is an open grave. That means your words smell like a rotting corpse. They deceive instead of profiting others. They leave their mark and poison like a snake bite. They overflow with curses and bitterness. And probably one of the greatest juxtapositions you see between our words is when you compare them to God's words. As one commentator put it, God's speech is the way he manifests his glory, but our speech is the way we manifest our sinfulness. But it's not just our words. It's also our feet. Paul has nothing good to say about how we treat our traveling companions through this life. We shed blood. We say things like, come too close to me and I'll cause your ruin and make you miserable. I don't care about your peace. Just get out of my way. Now, once again, we need to pause and make sure we understand this. Does that talk kind of offend your sensibilities? Is, is our speech really that bad? Are our relationships really that bad? Well, yes and no. No, because we all have good relationships where we speak kind words and hear kind words from other people, where we've traveled with people and enjoyed their company. So, so no, no, not all speech is bad in that sense. But yes, all speech is the way that Paul describes it because our words are touched by sin 
so that no one can speak their way into salvation. No one can walk their way into salvation. You need a greater power in your life for that to happen. And so Christ has set us free. How so? He takes that lonely walk by himself without companions, with his cross. And on the cross, he utters life-giving words. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We have this Christ who delivers us from this variety of sins, particularly in our relationships. Why? So that our relationships can now take on new meaning. So we can begin to enjoy one another and not feel like we have to earn our way to, 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 to the kingdom. Once we realize we're in the kingdom, once we realize that God has already given us that plot of land someday, you know, we're much more likely to share to delight in each other, to love each other, to pray for each other, not to keep warring and getting ahead of each other. Christ delivers us from that. And then finally, he delivers us from the variety of, of worship that we often uh, pretend to be performing. I, I know with the first two categories of personal and, and relational, we're, we're tempted to think that we're only talking about personal and sociological things, but no. Paul here in verse 18 gets to the root of the problem, and that is there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is a reference to our worship. The ultimate purpose of life is to be in awe of God, esteeming him as holy and, and majestic. We sang earlier this morning, awake my soul and sing the glories of thy God and King. Do we do that? Yes, yes we do. Do we do it perfectly? Is there any way to earn salvation by our worship? No. In fact, you may leave here and after five minutes begin to decenter the God or de-God the very God that you were worshiping a half an hour ago. That's how much sin has a hold on us. That's why we need salvation from Christ. Martin Luther said it this way, we never break commandments two through 10 unless we have already decided to break the first commandment. Why do I covet? Well, because I need it. God's provision isn't enough. I can do this, you know, where God can't. Why do we lie? Because I'm replacing God's truth with my truth. And on and on our sin goes, and all of this goes underneath the umbrella of our worship. Our souls are sleepy. But remembering the gospel wakes them up, doesn't it? Don't try to wake up your own soul. I know that awake my soul and sing is language to yourself, but not without the power of God in your life. And we have that if we have faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul, throughout this section, has been refuting the idea that a person could gain a right standing before God by anything that that person did. Paul is arguing like a lawyer would argue. And there's a law term here in verse 19 when he says, so that every mouth may be stopped. That's a term from the courtroom when a defendant has no more to say in response to the charges brought against them. The image which Paul has sought to convey throughout these verses is one of all humanity standing before God accountable to him for willful and inexcusable violations of his will, awaiting the sentence of condemnation that their lives deserve. From chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20, it's been bad news. Bad news, bad news. And once again, Paul summarizes this section with verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. 
But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This is how the catechism says it, and this is how we'll close today. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. We have been freed. Let us rejoice. Let's pray. And now, Father, in heaven, we thank you for the freedom that was given to us by the Son's birth and life of perfect obedience and atoning death and glorious, powerful resurrection and now authoritative session in heaven where we look with our eyes focused not on ourselves, not on our own works, but on his. And once again, how grateful we are I pray that your grace would overpower us this week so that we may live these kinds of delightful, shocking, surprising lives so that those who have not yet bowed the knee to Christ will be encouraged to do so. Help us to be bold in our witness, to call out sin where it's needed. Help us to be bold in our thankfulness as we show gratitude to people for their companionship. May, Lord, you just do a work in us that we cannot do for ourselves. In the name of the powerful Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.